Good morning, church. We're going to go ahead and start today. If you would take your seats. Welcome to our service here this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us today to worship. It's uh, one of those unique Sundays where you have a portion of the church up at family camp right now and, uh, and then us down here. And so we're worshiping in two different locations today. So please be praying for them as they pray for you. And uh, as we are a little bit separate today, but in one in spirit. So what a wonderful thing. Things are going well up at family camp and um, they're learning um, what it means to have joy through the book of Ephesians. So joy through the good times, joy through the hard times, uh, joy through persecution, different things like that. So that's what they're learning about, and it's been a wonderful time of worship and fellowship up there. If you are a first-time visitor today, we're so glad you came. Um, if you would like to learn more about our church, a lot of information on the website, but there's also some information from people there in the welcome booth, and they'd love to chat with you. Okay. We have a number of different things that we do during the year to raise funds for ministries. And so uh, we like to start in August, support for Slavic Gospel Missions Emmanuel's Child Program. You may have seen the Christmas tree uh, out there in the foyer. Um, we call it Christmas in August. And so um, this is a fundraiser for ministry to children in the Ukraine, Russia, and former Soviet bloc countries. So how interesting is that, right? That, that we'd be able to support children in the Ukraine and uh, Russia, uh, because they all need Jesus Christ. We need to minister to all of these people groups. So it's a wonderful thing. So if you'd like to uh, learn more about how to do that, take a look at your bulletin. It has your information on what it's about and um, how to go ahead and donate money for that. Well, the Ladies Roots and Rocks, this is the Ladies Ministry Hiking um, Group, are going to Moores Mountain Loop on Bogus Basin on Saturday, August 17th. So that, I'm sure, will be a wonderful trip. There's more details in your bulletin about that. We'll let you know that there are only two more Sundays to complete your goals for summer reading adventure. And so if you are doing the summer reading program, there's only a couple more Sundays. So just uh, you might want to pick up a book now if you haven't already and start going after that hard. There will be a combination baby shower and picnic to celebrate Mark and Sandra Robertson's coming baby boy. I think they've had uh, six girls? Six girls. And now they're having a boy. So, um, so that's exciting. August 10th, 11 a.m. on the church lawn. Uh, see your bulletin for details about that. There's a Worm Lake Camp Fall meeting uh, that's 9 a.m. Saturday, August 24th. So if you're involved in camp, uh, they'll be looking back at the 2024 camp season and forward to the 2025 season. So uh, just letting you know that that's coming up. If, if you're involved in camp, that would be something to sign up for and just, just to take note of. Well, this is the time for men's camp planning. And men's camp is coming up September 13th through the 15th. Uh, we got a wonderful camp planned this year. And uh, so this is the time to go ahead and grab those brochures. They're back at the welcome booth and to sign up for that. Um, it, it's going to be a great time and um, something to we will plan for ahead of time because those spots fill up quick if you're going to be doing RVs. Also want to let you know that we do have a men's breakfast in August and two Sundays. And we're looking at the issue of uh, a man and his anger. And so if you would like to do that, just go ahead and mark that. That's in two Saturdays from now at 9 a.m. And we'd love to have you there. Good food, good fellowship, good word. Well, there's a lot of other events going on in the bulletin. Uh, if you have offerings today, we have offering boxes in the foyer for your giving. And um, it's a little different this Sunday. We are, have a baptism coming up here. And uh, we have a missionary presentation from two different sets of missionaries today. So um, we have a lot going on. Um, so as we think about getting ready to see a baptism, now this is, this is something that developed at camp. And um, it's actually Jacob, who's been a two-month uh, intern here at the church. Um, his brother is getting baptized today. And so this is all connected to camp. It's an exciting connection that's there. And so as we think about these things and, and making statements for our faith, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and we pr give this time to you. We pray that you would um, help us to see the gospel in baptism, help us to recognize it in ourselves, and, Lord, to affirm the testimony that baptism is. We pray, Lord, that you would um, guide us this morning in all of the things that we do, that it would be led by the Holy Spirit, and that it would be guided by your word. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. So this is Michael Taron, and as Pastor said, Jacob Taron's um, brother. Michael has uh, been up at camp for, for quite a few years. Just this was my fifth year. Fifth year, there we go. And uh, Michael's 16, and this summer he was, he was busy. He counseled at junior camp, worked in the kitchen during middle school camp, and then was a camper during high school camp. Um, but uh, it's such a, a privilege um, to be uh, a part of that ministry, to be able to uh, watch the young men and young women grow in Christ, and then um, just the wonderful privilege of getting to do baptisms. Um, so, Michael, would you like to share your testimony? Yes. Um, so, I was born into a Christian home. So, I've always known God was part of my life, but he was just another part of it for a long time. That changed when I was about... 13, I was up at middle school camp, and I realized that he's God, and that I want to follow him for the rest of my life. Amen. Amen. Do you have a favorite verse? Favorite verse? Probably John 10.10. 10. Um, this quote from Jesus, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come so that he may have life and have it abundantly. Praise God. Amen. <clears throat> So we get to talk quite a bit before um, we, we enter the waters of baptism, and we just make sure that uh, everything is understood, that is, is baptism um, something that is essential for salvation? Do you have to be baptized to be saved? No, it is not. No, it is not. So what is baptism? It's a picture of? Um, death to the old self and being resurrected in the Holy Spirit. There we go. And it's a public confession of a, of a personal conviction and a personal choice of, of accepting Christ as your Savior. And the church gets to celebrate. And now we all know that Michael is a, a brother in the faith. We can celebrate together and look forward to that heavenly reunion one day. But in the meantime, we get to live a life as the body together. So let's, let's celebrate as we, we do this baptism. Michael, do you confess Christ alone for your salvation? I do. Has anybody else forced you to do this baptism? Is this your choice? This is my choice. It's your choice. So it is a wonderful privilege for you to follow in the example of Christ. And it is my honor and privilege as your brother in Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, as we continue to celebrate what the Lord is doing, we have um, two sets of missionaries that have come share with us what God has placed on their heart as they have given their lives to Christ and what they're going to be doing. So uh, we want to be praying for them, and we want, if you would like to take them on as your personal support, then um, they will be available in the foyer um, to talk about and give you more information about that. So um, the first is Andrea Davis, and uh, she is sister of Scott Davis. Scott, hey, brother. He's back there. And um, I think I see rest of, some of the rest of the family back there, too. And then um, Tim and Amy and kids, uh, Dawson's. So they're going to come um, share with us about their ministries. Okay, Andrea, come on up. Well, that is great that we could witness another fellow believer joining God's kingdom today. Um, so just a quick bit about me. Um, so I grew up, well, I was born in Idaho, and my folks are from here, was raised in Missouri at a missions group there, um, and then just recently we had moved back a while ago and got into missions, so had a heart from a young age to go into missions, and we'll see if any of the slides come up. But um, So I'm a missionary to Lisbon, Portugal, and I'm with Greater Lisbon Christian Academy, and I'm serving with ABWE, which is Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. And so my role over there is I'm serving at a missionary school. So most of the kiddos at this school are missionary kids. It's a pretty small school. 
um, very family oriented. You know, a lot of these kids have um, been moved over there. They're away from family, from friends, and so they're building a new community around them, and so they're getting to see that. Um, and so I teach third and fourth grade. We should have had the other missionaries come up so you could see. <laughs> um, so Lisbon, so Portugal is a pretty small country and only about 3.4% are missionaries, or not missionaries, my goodness, um, are Christians. So that's a pretty generous estimate as well. So most of them are Roman Catholic, about 87% is what they estimate. Um, but even that is going more to postmodernism to atheism. Um, so there's a big need in Portugal. It's a pretty dark area. Um, so I'm also involved in a local church. It's called Igreja Baptista do Montijo, um, and it's a Portuguese-speaking church. So I'm working on learning the language, um, and I help in the children's ministry because you can give a look to a kiddo and they can understand it pretty universally, right? <laughs> um, so I'm also involved in, um, so I was taking some language classes and through that I was able to witness to a Muslim man um, and get him involved in church ministry. Um, so he's, not church ministry, I'm sorry. I keep making these mistakes. Um, so he's actually gone to church with me quite a few times and I've gotten him a Bible in his language and getting him involved in some Bible studies so that way he can hopefully um, be open to the gospel. Um, and then at the church that I'm working at, I'm also involved, oh, here we go. We'll see how far off I was on my thing here. If you just wanna go up to the top real quick. There we go. So Portugal is in, I forgot to tell you guys this, it is in Europe, it's not in South America. A lot of people think it's in South America. Um, so I'm in Lisbon in the capital. Um, right outside of there. Um, so like I mentioned before, if you can go to the next slide. So it's, yeah, 3.4% is evangelical Christians. And like I said, that's a pretty generous estimate. Um, and then the next slide is a picture of the, all the students and staff. So it's a pretty international school. We have missionaries from America, obviously, but also from Germany, the Netherlands, and then we have a few unbelieving families that come to the school that are in Lisbon for business and stuff, just a small percent of the school. So there's an, also an opportunity there to witness to unbelievers. Um, so we have families from like South Korea, Nepal, India, um, uh, Brazil. And then on the next slide, you'll see, so this is a map I don't know if you can see those orange dots, but those are all the different church plant and campus ministries that the parents are involved at. So most of the families at the church, like I said, are missionary kids. So they're involved in church planning in Lisbon and they just, the kiddos come to the school during the day. So there's about 15 church plants that they're involved in. So even though it's a pretty small school, that's a big impact in Lisbon and the surrounding area. Um, and then the next slide. So there's a picture of the church that I'm involved with, um, and then the children's ministry. It kind of fluctuates, and it, I just jump to whichever class needs the most help that day. Um, but it's been a really good opportunity for my language speaking as well, as it's nice to learn at the children's level, because then I can pick up quite a few more things. Um, and then the next slide. So again, um, the picture on the left is going to be um, a bunch of people from my language class that I was taking. Pretty much everyone was from India or Pakistan. Um, it's a very international city, which has been really neat because most internationals speak quite a level of English. And so I've been able to jump into ministry right off the bat, which I thought would take quite a while to get established. Um, and then there's also some international Bible studies that have been going on. And then I just wanted to ask you guys too to pray for me. Um, and pray for the people of Portugal, so the nationals and the internationals. Um, the internationals, there's a big need there. There's a lot of people moving into Portugal that are studying or working, and they're just really lonely. They've moved away from their families, so there's a huge opportunity to make connections and build relationships and witness to them. Um, and then also when people move out of their country, a lot of times they're more willing to hear the gospel, like when they're not in their culture. Um, and then also be praying for this 
the school, the staff, and the students, um, and the ministries that have come out of that, um, and all the church plants. And then if you could also be praying for language learning, that would be great. Um, and just praise God with me that um, there were so many more ministry opportunities that I was able to jump into and relationships to build and looking forward to going back. So I am going back long term. I've been there for 10 months um, and then I'm going back long term. So we'll see how long God has me there. And um, if you guys could pray about too, um, I am fully supported for this year going forward and I'm staying on the school property, but next year I'll be looking for housing. Um, so maybe be praying about joining my support team. Um, and then I also have signups at the back of the church um, in the foyer. So if you guys wanna meet with me afterwards and sign up, I can give you, I have a monthly update that I send out pretty regular. Um, so you can get to know the ministry a little bit better and how you can pray for Portugal. And um, I also have some cards out there too. So I would love to get to know you guys and thank you for opening up your church and praying about Portugal. It's okay. I just wanted to kind of introduce uh, Tim and Amy Dawson real quick here. Uh, Forty-some years ago, I was, I don't know if you knew, I was an intern pastor here uh, taking care or uh, leading the junior high youth group. And we, we were right here one, one Wednesday night, and a young couple came in the back door with uh, their, their junior high girl and said, you know, we're part of another church, but would you mind uh, if our daughter came to your youth group because they don't have a youth group? And uh, that couple that came in was uh, Dave and Linda Johnson, and some of you know Dave and Linda. They started attending our church on a regular basis, and that little girl they brought in was Amy. And, uh, and Amy, Amy was, uh, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old, but she was already, I'm sure, the tallest girl in her class. <laughs> and, uh, and she was a sweet girl, and I'll, and I'll just say she told Kenny and I that she was gonna be a, she, she was gonna be a missionary doctor. <laughs> And that's what she became. And uh, we, we really love these guys. And so they're going to tell you a lot more. And they will be in back afterwards to talk about. But they'll also be in this in, in Pastor Shaw's uh, Sunday school class, too. So if you want to hear a lot more about their ministry, you can go to, go to his class this morning. Thanks, Freddie. That was really cool. <laughs> I feel like anything we say is just sort of going to be like not quite as cool as that. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm Tim, and this is Amy, of course, and we've been living in Barcelona for, just outside of Barcelona for the past four years. Um, we're sent by our home church, Fellowship Missionary Church, and also we're missionaries in Indiana, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, we work with a mission called Modern Day, uh, which has missionaries uh, all over the world and in lots of different countries. We do have kids. Um, we didn't em embarrass them too much by having them come up, but we are going to make them stand. So uh, that's uh, Isaiah there in the blue shirt, and he just uh, graduated from high school and uh, at Black Forest Academy, which is a school that uh, Freddie and Candy are very familiar with. Their kids went there too, and that's kind of how we knew about it. So in, in Germany, it sounds like knowing the Harrises is the way to go. Uh, in life uh, in general. Uh, sister Ari, she's the oldest. She goes to Wheaton College. And uh, Daniel is the youngest. And he uh, is with us in Barcelona. So we've got uh, kids all over the place. And he's got two more years of high school there. We do two main things uh, w with our ministry. The first one is we do local ministry in Barcelona. We're involved in uh, a church called Good Shepherd. I I've got a slide that kind of has a church service. There's maroon walls. I don't know if I just to kind of give you an idea of what our church looks like. That, that's one of us too, but there's a, um, our, our church is uh, right in the middle of Barcelona where they built the, um, kind of did a lot of remodeling and uh, did some building for the Olympics in 1992. That's our, our church was, used to be the um, chapel that was built, it was kind of an interfaith chapel for the Olympics in Barcelona, and now um, we rent from the, the, the Catholic parishes that, that is there. Um, every week. So that's where we have our services for our um, evangelical Anglican church. And I head up the worship ministry there. And we're a small, w w small but powerful is what one of our uh, uh, attendees calls it. One of my friends from, from college when I was living in Spain is the pastor there now. And that's how we, he invited us to come and serve in that church. And, 
and uh, we really felt like God was pushing us to do that, so we're heavily involved there. It's a small church, um, like uh, Andrea was talking about in, in Europe, there, there really are very few um, believers in Christ that follow Christ. It's very post-Christian. We maybe have 1% um, where we live in Spain, and because of a lot of the political history and church history and dictatorships and everything, church is something that a lot of people uh, either had a bad experience or have a bad view of. So. Um, it's, it's tough ground to till uh, a lot, but we've got about, um, I would say, what, a good week is 25. Churches are smaller there. You, yeah, but the, but, uh, the interesting thing is um, we'll have hundreds of people uh, who watch our videos and the sermons and the services uh, online every week. We've had just an explosion with that ministry, and uh, a guy from Honduras kind of helped get us uh, going with that. Um, who moved to, he moved to Spain and, and uh, lives at our place off and on, and he's been really helping us develop that ministry so we can reach a lot more people, and then some of them end up actually coming. Ones that live uh, very close or close enough to, uh, to the church can do that. We're involved, uh, the other thing with our local ministry is food banks. We have a sister church, and I think there was, there's a slide before where it's got people going into a, looks like bars, yeah, that's a great one, a big, big pallet of potatoes. That's a great picture. Um, this program is really cool. The um, local governments in Spain, they actually have social workers that meet with people and assess their needs. People that are poor and need help, need food and, and housing and other needs. They need places to distribute the food. And uh, our sister church in, is one of them uh, in the next town over. And we're heavily involved with this. They, what we do with, the, with that program is they are sent to our church. That's the food bank they've been assigned. But we can talk about Christ with them. We can share our faith with them if they're open to that. We certainly can't get pushy about that. We don't have people out there preaching the whole time. And because some people, they just want to come get their food. But we're able to have uh, spiritual conversations. And, and then the church will have uh, certain classes that will help people um, get more integrated into the neighborhood and to hopefully draw them to Christ. Everything from English classes to classes on how to be a waiter or waitress at a restaurant, because that's a very common job that a lot of people who are foreign who come to town would like to do, and they need to learn how to do that. And the pastor of that church, that used to be his job before he was a pastor. So they're trying to do everything they can to get the people in the neighborhood, because all these people live nearby. That's why they've been assigned to this food bank. So they come by and we put the, um, we get the units ready every week. They scan their card and they get the food that's allotted to them. So basically um, all the, um, the legwork is done and we run the program the way uh, the city wants us to run it and we can share Christ with them and, and our love with them at the same time. So it's a really cool opportunity for us to do that. Now. We have some other cool stuff happening. You might have seen on our letter that we also do some work in Africa and with training doctors, and Amy's gonna to talk to you about that. Oh, it's so good to be back here. Thank you guys for inviting us up. Um, one of the, as a missionary doctor that I'd always wanted to be, one of the opportunities that we have now is to actually work in Africa. And the reason we didn't go to Africa is because these opportunities are spread throughout Africa. So I'm working with a group that is training uh, African physicians and missionaries as they're starting their own training programs for family medicine um, to be better faculty members. So I'm in faculty development and I've had the opportunity to work in Burundi as this picture shows. Um, Burundi, I actually have two roles. I'm helping with the faculty development training and then I'm also just pitching in as an extra pair of hands and I'll be going there um, I've gone there twice. I'll be continuing to go for one month every six months um, to help them as they're starting their family medicine residency program. So I'll be teaching one of the curriculum points of community medicine in addition to helping them with their faculty development. Um, and we can flip through that a little bit, our Burundi program. The Burundi Hospital is um, additionally supported by Samaritan's Purse, who's giving large grants for the hospital buildings. Um, I don't know if there's another slide in there. Yep, they have a refeeding program, Busoma program, where they have their own grain mix that they put together, and uh, they're helping with uh, malnutrition. This is also in the malnutrition program um, that's attached to the hospital. So the hospital has had brand new facilities built through Samaritan's Purse. Uh, they've got a really great pediatric program. Um, the country has uh, health insurance for pediatrics. 
up to age five and nobody else. So um, we're able to help take advantage of that and make sure that the kids are healthy up to age five. Um, the other program I've been working at is in Egypt and that's on our prayer letter. I don't know if we have an Egypt photo in there. Do we have an Egypt photo in there? Um, in Egypt, they have just started, there's 10% of Egypt is Christian, historically. And so there is a Christian hospital that has started a new Christian um, training program for internal medicine physicians. And my role is I'm working with a group that helps train those physicians to be good faculty members so that they are effective at training new physicians who will then also be more faculty members. And that program is unique. There's no missionaries there. It's all local um, Christian physicians and talent. And our goal then is to make them able to continue to, uh, to reproduce, to have their own programs, and then also to lead other consults for other programs. So for instance, there's a group in Cameroon that has been producing such excellent internal medicine physicians that the Cameroon faculty are now also going to Egypt to train them how to be faculty. There are groups in, in Kenya that again have had such great training that those faculty members in Kenya are going to Cameroon and they're going to Burundi and they're going to um, Ethiopia to all help uh, work with their faculty to be excellent faculty and produce Christian doctors with a spiritual curriculum as well as the medical curriculum that are then very effective for uh, delivering um, spiritual and medical care as well as training other doctors to do it. So I'm excited. It's a very tiny, specific role, but it has such great potential for people uh, to continue to spread the gospel where they are. Anything else? A couple of prayer requests real quick for us. Uh, first, um, we are raising about 1500 uh, a month in new support uh, while we're home in the summertime, and we would love to talk to you more about that. We don't pressure anybody. Um, we're really uh, blessed and honored to be a way that we can um, be a way that you reach out um, to the rest of the world. Um, we'd love to talk to you outside um, after uh, church is over. And also, we'd love to... Um, uh, if you want to hear a little more in depth, we're going to be um, talking at Pastor Shaw's Sunday School today. And if you say, well, that's not my Sunday School class, or I'm not in that class, don't worry about that. You don't have to come there regularly. Nobody's going to say, where you been? Just come on in and uh, hang out with us. We're going to talk more about that. And we would love to pack the house for that today. Whether or not support is something that you'd consider, that's no problem. We'd love to share more about what we're doing. So if you just look for the coffee, you will see us. Um, outside because we love coffee and um, so we are praying for more prayer and financial supporters and uh, praying for our family too um, we've got uh, we're at that point in life where your kids are getting out of high school or close to that and and kind of branching off in life somewhat uh, last year we had kids on three continents at the same time or three countries at the same time and uh, it's, it's somewhat similar to that this year um, with our son just graduating and another daughter in college and another one in high school with us so Family dynamics is uh, always a prayer for us, and um, we're really blessed to be able to have those kids and to be able to be partnering with you. Um, many of you have supported us in the past when we were missionaries in Ecuador, and we don't take that for granted. We love coming back to Caldwell um, pretty much every year, and it's great to see so many uh, wonderful faces. Um, I'm just going to pray a real quick prayer, and then we'll wrap it up. Lord, thanks so much for, for this church. We are so grateful for our friends at FBC and how they've supported us over the years and prayed for us and advocate for us um, and that missionaries need that and uh, we need it badly. And we're just so grateful for the reception that we get every time we come here. We just pray that you'd grow this church and bless it and multiply it. We pray that in your name. Amen. Thanks. Now, would you stand with me as we read the verse of the month? We have a new verse of the month from Exodus 15, 13, and it really emphasizes the redeeming hand of God. So will you say it with me? You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Exodus 15, 13. Now, would you take a minute and greet some people around you?
All right, church. I love that we enjoy each other. It is good. We're going to start our time of uh, worship this morning with Amen Because He Lives. I believe in the sun. I believe. I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never because he lives I was dead in the grave I was covered in sin and shame I heard mercy call my name he rolled the stone future in his hand. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never ends. Because he lives. Amen, church. Way to start. Uh, we are going to sing All Creatures of Our God and King. It's a wonderful song. It's got some thous and yees in there, but it, it flows beautifully. <laughs> I love it. All Creatures of Our God and King. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia! Thou burning sun with golden beams, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in that Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 
Father, we, your church, <laughs> the bride of the amazing groom of Christ. Father, we come to you this morning with joy and thankfulness. Father, thank you for these reports of your word being spread throughout the world and that your kingdom will come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray for your, the word that is delivered this morning. Thank you, Father, for the saving grace that is your son. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Let's be seated. Well, the children can now be dismissed for Children's Church. And I want to open up our Bibles today to Ruth chapter 1. We are going to be spending the month of August in the book of Ruth. And a beloved scripture by many people. And uh, what a wonderful, concise story. A nice, concise story for a one month look at it. And so we're going to be going through Ruth chapter 1 today. Well, back when I was in the sixth grade, I had a friend named Jason Rivera. And Jason and I were close friends. And one day uh, we were playing sports out uh, after school, and we both went into the bathroom. And uh, he said, Brett, I think we need to become blood brothers. And I was like, yeah, let's become blood brothers. And uh, he said, okay. He goes, this means we're, we're brothers for life. I was like, yeah, brothers for life. And he said, okay, so what we got to do is we got to cut our hands. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we got to cut our hands, a little cut. And we've got to shake hands with those cut hands. And we combine blood. And then we become blood brothers. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of cool, kind of nervous. And then, and then I started thinking about, you know, uh, do I really want to combine blood with someone else? You know, this was the 80s, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and so I was nervous. I'm like, I don't know, man. I mean, I want to be become friends, but I don't know about this blood brother thing. But what took over in me was that belief that I wanted a close friend, that I was connected to closely. We wanted to take our friendship to that level. So, I don't know. I feel like in my memory it was a rusty razor blade or something. It was, I don't really remember what it was exactly, but it was not sanitary. And we cut our hands and we did it. And man, we were close friends for the sixth grade. <laughs> Until the seventh grade and we went to different schools and didn't hardly see each other again. You know, um, this happens in almost all relationships. Relationships without commitment, without obligation, um, oftentimes don't work. We need something more. Well, why is it that that happens? Why is it that, that we move from, we got to go from friend to best friend, right? We got we to gotta, we gotta obligate to one another. We got we to gotta commit to one another. Um, and that's because it's a natural human desire to have commitments when you have relationship. And really, that's our, our topic today. We are going to start with the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth is not a story. And when I say story, I mean a true story from the narrative of Scripture. This is just how God has chosen us to tell us about himself is through this true story. And... Um, and so it's not about a special act of God. This is not about something where you're going to see God do amazing miracles or do amazing things or show up in amazing ways. This is a book about relationships. This is a book about friendships and loyalty and obligations to one another. And what you'll see is through these relationships, you will see God through it all. These human actions will prove God to us. And so we want to talk about obligations and relationships. They really go hand in hand. It's hard to have a relationship without an obligation. It's hard to have an obligation without a relationship. And there's a couple ways in which these things interrelate. First, we know that obligations 
tend to establish relationships, right? One of the best examples of that is giving birth to a child. When you have a child, uh, you are immediately obligated to that child, right? The, the state recognizes you as the official parents of that child, and so now you are obligated to have a relationship with that child. But we know this, that at the age of 18, the obligation legally ends. And so your hope as a parent is that you've built so much relationship into the life of your child that it turns into full relationship with very little, if any, obligation from the parents. So there's an obligation that leads to a relationship, and, and, and we should want that. We should be building into the relationship of our children when they're young so that we can have a relationship that's outside of the obligation when they're older. But the other thing, if you flip it, is there are oftentimes when relationships set up obligations, where we start with a relationship, not an obligation. It's a choice, and it's a friendship or something we get into, and that becomes an obligation. And dating and marriage is a good example of that, where um, we start with a relationship that that is dating, and we make it clear there is no obligation. And, and you make that clear until you have the, what's called the DTR, determine the relationship, right? And then you start laying out the obligations and the commitments that you have, but ultimately the obligation becomes what? It becomes your wedding day when you say your vows and you enter into covenant with that spouse, and so you, you take a relationship that develops and flowers into an obligation. But the interplay between obligations and relationships can be tricky, can't they, when you really start playing them out. One interplay between these two things is that it is oftentimes difficult to judge the nature of a true relationship if it starts with an obligation, right? If, if you're in a relationship with somebody and, and you started with an obligation, or maybe you didn't, but you're in a long obligation, you may begin to wonder, um, how much relationship do you actually have? This is true of work, isn't it? You may have friends at work, but are they really your friends? Or are they friends because you work there? You really only ever know once you leave your job. You actually find out who your friends really are, the ones who keep up with you when you're no longer working there. And then you know the difference between the work friends and the people that you actually have a close relationship with. Another interplay between obligations and relationships is that obligations without relationship, if we have an obligation, but we don't have a relationship, it can lead to resentment and bitterness in the obligation. We can want out of that obligation. That happens a lot of times with a lot of things. And the, the true is of the opposite. A relationship can lead to resentment and bitterness because of an obligation. So, so you can actually be an actual relationship, but the aspects of the obligation can create bitterness and resentment as well. And we know that in life, every person that we connect with, we have a choice of whether or not to enter into a relationship or enter into an obligation with those people. So we have to ask the question, how does a Christian, how does a believer handle the tension of obligations and relationships that both glorifies God and loves people. Um, should we avoid obligations with other Christians and have relationships alone? And is that a more love-based relationship? Because some people feel that way. They say, I'm not going to enter into an obligation with you. I'm going I'm to invite you over to my house, and we're going to spend time together, and I'm going to base everything that we have together on this relationship because it's truly loving, and that, there's a sort of a sense to that. But the other question is, um, if we avoid obligations to the people we have relationships with in the church, can we truly be faithful to those people? If we haven't committed anything, if we don't, not actually in some sort of an obligation to those folks that we sort of owe them something. Can you, can you actually have a real relationship, a, a depth of relationship without obligation? Well, we will see that both our obligations and our relationships can have a godly focus. And that godly focus is based on two things, that we should enter into both relationships and obligations with both loyalty and kindness. And we're going to see that in the book of Ruth, loyalty and kindness. And so we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 as we begin to talk about this passage. So as we start the book of Ruth, we're going to find out immediately about our first point this morning, which is that 
uh, obligations and relationships sometimes come to an end. And so the question is, what's left? Um, so the story of Ruth uh, is placed contextually in the time of the judges. We don't know exactly when the time of the judges this takes place. But the time of the judges is the time after the conquering of Canaan, when the Jews have entered into the promised land, and they have gotten settled. And shortly after they get settled, they enter into idol worship. They start turning away from the Lord. And so as they turn away from the Lord, people start entering into all of this idolatry that leads to people doing whatever is right in their own eyes. And so it's a time fraught with God's judgment on the people of God, that God is both bringing um, people to attack them and famines and all kinds of natural disasters to cause them to turn back to him. And so it's a time that is tumultuous and chaotic. The time of the judges is considered one of the most chaotic time in the Old Testament. And so it's in the middle of this chaotic time where we focus in on one family. And we go, what was this family like? And so we're gonna look at faithfulness, we're gonna look at loyalty, we're gonna look at kindness in this very family. So let's read verses one through five. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And the man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These two Moabite wives, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. And both Malon and Chilion died, so the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So the introduction to the story of Ruth is a story of relationships and obligations that have now come to an end. And so the, the question we get to at the end of this section is, what is left for this lady uh, named Naomi, who's, the, who's now the, the focus of the story in the early parts. What is left for this lady? Well, let's break this down. We see that this is a Jewish family in verse 1, and that they leave their homeland to sojourn in Moab. And the catalyst for this family's move is a famine. Now, famines can be caused by drought, war, disease, and so on. We know that this was a chaotic time, um, but what we don't know if um, this was brought on by the Lord, if this was an actual judgment, this famine. It doesn't say that. It doesn't tell us. All it says is there's a famine in the land. And so the family decides that they're going to leave the promised land and head to a land that is not filled with Jewish people. Now, whether or not this was an act of faithlessness, we don't know. The Scriptures also doesn't tell us whether it was. All we know is, is that they left. Now, they were from Bethlehem, which is about six miles south of Jerusalem. Remember that for the last sermon on this. Bethlehem is very important that this is where they're from. And Moab is a country that was neighboring country of the Gentiles on the other side of the Dead Sea. So they're going to skirt around the Dead Sea to the other side of, of the land to um, Moab. And this is a neighboring country of Gentiles on the other side of the Dead Sea. Now, Moab is the traditional enemy of the Jews. But it appears that this was a time of peace so that they could actually peacefully go and not be treated badly by the Moabites. Verse 2 tells us that there were four people in this family. They were Ephrathites. Wondering what that means? It's just another name for Bethlehem. It means that they were inhabitants of Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. So they basically are people from Bethlehem. And then we see in verse 3 that the dad dies. And so inserted into this story, People that, imagine in your mind, you already have left your homeland because there's no food. You're living in a foreign land with all these foreigners, and, and then your husband dies. I mean, this is bad. This is really bad. And what it would be like for Naomi to lose her husband, they've, they've lost everything at their home, they went looking for some provision somewhere else, and now the breadwinner dies. Can you imagine what you would feel like if you were Naomi, if you were dealing with this kind of stress? They were vulnerable immigrants without the patriarch of the family. But at least she had her two sons to comfort her and care for her. Let's look at verse 4. It tells us that these sons married two women. And it tells us they are Moabite women. Now, 
we begin to wonder immediately there, was it okay for these guys to marry these Moabite women? They're not Jewish. Well, an interesting little fact is that the Jews were, were told they cannot marry Canaanite women, but they were not told that they could not marry Moabite women. So there's not even necessarily a picture of whether or not this was disobedience and unfaithfulness or not. We just know that these two men marry the two, two local girls in the place where they are um, living. But probably you could look at this from a Jewish perspective and say that it was probably unwise for them to marry Moabite women because they were followers of idols, which is always the perennial problem is when the men of God marry the unbelieving women of Canaan or the land surrounding that, and it leads them into idolatry, even to the point where someone as wise as Solomon could fall into idolatry himself to combine his beliefs with his wife's beliefs. And so it was not let's say it was not advisable for them to marry these Moabite women, although God will use it for his glory. But one would expect at this point of the story that if, if you have a point where the sons are there and then they marry these women, and it says that they were there for 10 years, that after 10 years' time, that what would come next? Children. And this was incredibly important, and we need to stop at this moment as I'm building up the context for you of how important that for Jewish families to have kids. You see, in ancient Israel, having heirs was vital to keep your clan perpetuating. The Jews were appointed land by families, so to keep the land that was their ancestral homeland that was designated to them by God, they had to have an heir to inherit that land. There was no greater tragedy for a Jew than for their family to cease to exist. So 10 years should have led to children, and it did not. Again, was this also a judgment? We have no idea. We just know these are the circumstances. But then, tragedy of tragedy, both Malon and Chilean, the sons of Naomi, died. And, and, and this, this little section ends with a sad, sad note. So the woman, by the way, it doesn't say her name. She's now just an uh, unidentified in the sense that she's sort of lost her identity. The woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So we, we end the beginning of this story with this extreme sense of loss, this extreme sense of, of understanding what this poor woman is going through and what she feels like. And what we are left with is this obligation. This is, the, this is what we should know. The obligation here is you have a widow and her two widowed daughters-in-law who are Moabites. And so uh, the question is, what is the obligation here? The, the, the actual relationship obligations of the husband and the sons is gone. So the question is, what is a daughter-in-law to her mother when her husband is gone, right? If, if, if the connection to your mother-in-law was your husband, do you still have an obligation to your mother-in-law? It's a great question, isn't it? What is she? Well, at the very least, we can see here, the obligations here are very thin. So the question will be, what will happen to poor Naomi? Will she survive? No husband to be the breadwinner, no sons to be the bread. Nobody to care for her. Now she has these, these two daughters, and in this economy, um, the, the, the daughter-in-laws couldn't really do much work, and so starvation is a possibility. And so that's where we're left with this section. But then the next section, the second sections, and we're going to have three, because you know I do three, uh, is the obligation rescinded. Ruth will now take the obligation that her daughter-in-law has and rescind it and remove the obligation of the two daughter-in-laws. So let's read verses 6 through 13. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out for the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. 
If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it's exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. The beginning of this section, Naomi decided it was time to go back. It was time to go back to her homeland because the famine was over. It seems that the daughters-in-law had planned with this thin obligation that they had that they would stick with their mother-in-law and that they would go back with her to Israel, which is a major decision because they were actually going to leave their families and their homeland and go live in, in, in Jewish Israel. And the, the connection here, the obligation here is this. When a, when a married Jewish man dies, his widow was obligated to marry one of his brothers and have children in his name to carry on the man's family name. So the obligation here is that they are supposed to have children with um, the other sons of Naomi to carry on the man's family name and to be able to inherit the land. This was called Leverite marriage, and it was described in Deuteronomy 25. And this was a major obligation imposed on a woman at this time. Ladies, can you imagine if your husband died that you marry his brother? I'm just looking to see what the reactions are. Okay. Out of obligation. Simply out of obligation. Not out of relationship. Because you have to. You don't even know, you know, if you get along with this guy. You have to marry him and have children by him. They were willing to do that. Except Naomi now tells them, look, <laughs> I release you ladies from this obligation. Verses 8 through 10, she releases them. She says, go back to your family and she goes, and have the blessing of your husbands. What does she mean? Your Moabite husbands, remarry, she's saying. Go marry a Moabite guy and have children. And she blesses them on account of their kindness. And so she there, therefore asked God to lead them in their lives. She says, um, may the Lord deal kindly with you, verse 8, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She recognizes that they have been extremely kind to stick with her with their loyalty. And so she, she removes the obligation. But then we find out there um, that they, they resist. We see here that um, she wants to um, let them go. She kisses them in verse 9, and, and as a sort of a kiss goodbye, we call that. And they lifted up their voices and they wept, and they said, no, we'll return with you to your people. So now they resist. She's released them, and they go, no, 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 we will go with you. But most people think that this is sort of just a cultural expectation to resist. You know, it's kind of like when you go out to a meal with some uh, other couples, and uh, the check comes, you know, and, and one of the couples grabs that check, and they go, I'm going to pay for it. And you go, oh, no, 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 no. Let me help. And they go, no, 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 I got this. And you go, okay, if you insist. <laughs> right? You, 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 there's a sort of a cultural expectation that you'll put up a little resistance, but then you'll relent at the end. You'll go, oh, okay, yeah, well, <laughs> at least I tried. You know I was willing. Uh, it, it's cool, right? It's good. And this is what they're doing here. They're going, at least should, should, should not say immediately, go, yippee, I'm free of my mother-in-law. So they're going, no, no, let's go with you. But then she insists that they not go with her in verse 11. She goes, no, no, turn back. Why will you go with me? And then she says the main point, um, I'm not going to have any more kids. I'm not going to have any more children. And you know what? Even if I got pregnant immediately, they would still be too young for you. It's, it's just not going to work for you to be able to marry any of my future sons. So you truly, girls, you can go. You can head out and go back to your homeland. They needed to cut their losses, and they needed to enter into the future life. But then she reveals something else about an obligation here. She releases them from their obligation, but then she reveals that in her obligation that she does have, which is her obligation to God, she is quite bitter. Notice there she says um, in verse 13 at the end, it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. 
she reveals that she, by the way, when she says the Lord, she is indicating he is her God. She's a believer. She believes in the Lord. She is, she is faithful to the Lord. But she feels like the Lord has dealt bitterly with her. And so she is in an obligation to God. But she is not happy about her relationship with him. So it's this re- obligation she has. I'm stuck with the Lord. I'm with him. But he has not treated me well. And so I am bitter about my relationship with God. And that's the interplay that we need to see with relationships and obligations. What greater obligation do we have than our obligation to God, which we entered into freely uh, by choice, which was connected with, then established a relationship. But oftentimes we will hold on to our obligation to the Lord, but our relationship, we struggle. We're like, I'm with you, Lord, but sometimes... I don't know what you're doing, and, and sometimes we can even get to the point where we are bitter at God for what he's doing. So then we get to the final crux of the third point here, which is this. We get to three choices made. Three choices are made by each woman of choices made that will be revealed. You know, a lot of people feel that they have no choices when they're obligated. And one of the main points we want to take this morning is this. No matter what you are obligated to, or who you're obligated to, you always have a choice of how you'll respond. You always have a choice. No matter how obligated and maybe stuck you feel, you always have a choice. Let's take a look at verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you, or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Can you imagine Naomi? Oh, it's like that. Then let's go. We have two choices made here. The first is the choice of Orpah. And Naomi had released Orpah, and so we see here the ending of the obligation and the relationship of Orpah. Orpah had every right to leave. There's there's really nothing negative about her leaving. She had been released by her mother-in-law, and um, she had every right to go. But one little thing about this we need to remember is by ending the obligation and the relationship, even with validity, it led to a lack of what could have been. Because Naomi says, go back to your gods. And I believe that if she had gone with Naomi back to Israel, she might, might have found the Lord. It was very evident here that that was not part of it because, because she let go of that relationship. It seems like she might have also let go of the Lord. You see, uh, relationships help us turn to the Lord. And if we live in isolation, brothers and sisters, it's very, very difficult to be encouraged by a Christian. We need to embrace the believers in our life and, and receive the blessing that comes with them. And sometimes you don't have to. She didn't have to stay with Naomi, but she could have been blessed if she had. You could, you could be blessed if you stay in the relationships or even obligate to people in your life. But if you resist it and you don't, Um, you may really be missing out on true blessings. So that's the first choice. The second choice is this one of Ruth's, and it's quite amazing. She makes a choice to obligate herself out of relationship. She has a relationship with her mother-in-law, and she wants to hold on to it, literally. It says that she clung. She clung to Naomi. And that word clung is very important. You can't say it too often without it sounding weird. Clung. (laughs) But clung is the same Hebrew word used of the marriage covenant in Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his wife and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Cling, cling or clung, uh, cling to her in loyalty and covenant. This act of choosing to stay with Naomi was the non-reasonable choice. This is not something she should have done. If people were advising her, they would say, uh, Ruth, don't go with Naomi. Why? 
Uh, well, first of all, you're, going, you're clinging to your aged, widowed, foreign, childless, possibly cursed mother-in-law to a foreign land, which means that if you go with her, you'll probably never marry again. You will be childless, and you're committing yourself to the care of this elderly woman. So why does she do it? It's a good question, isn't it? Why did Ruth cling to Naomi? Well, because she chose loyalty and kindness. And those two things went together. Verse 15, Naomi pointed out what Ruth could have if she left. Right? She says, look at your sister-in-law. She left. She went to her gods. Return after her. And so there's even this pressure. It's so interesting, isn't it, that, that Naomi is pressuring her not to be faithful to her. And even more so, Ruth goes, I'm sticking with you. You can kick me to the curb. I'm going to follow you. I'm going with you. And so she goes, she's faithful even against peer pressure, even against the peer pressure of her fellow sister-in-law. She's like, I'm not going to follow Orpah. I'm sticking with you. You don't want me to stick with you. She doesn't want me to stick with you. She doesn't want to stick with you. But I'm going to stick with you. Ruth's pretty amazing, isn't she? Don't we all wish we had a friend like that? Can we be a friend like that? So she goes and she makes a full commitment to Naomi. Not only does she make a full commitment to Naomi, she makes a full commitment to Israel and Jehovah God. She says, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She is doing nothing less than completely giving her life to the Lord at this moment. She even invoked a curse from God himself if she failed to keep her obligation. Didn't she? She said, may the Lord, verse 17, may the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts from you. That's a curse on herself. She says, may the Lord do bad things to me if I'm not committed to you for life, for the rest of my life. Whew. So I just want to apply this and think about it, what what do you think of an obligation like that? What is the Bible telling us? We live in an age when people feel that obligations to other people is a burden, don't we? People often want to make sure they have a way to get out of every obligation. They want to make sure if we obligate ourselves to people, it's very thin. We want to make sure we got a way out of this. So we can do what we want to do. We are a backdoor culture. We enter into the front door of relationships, but we always keep a back door. So we can exit. We can pull the ripcord. This is shocking in our culture, isn't it? This kind of friendship, this kind of love, this kind of loyalty. A lot of people these days, when I talk about obligations to others, kind of look and go, well, I don't obligate to anybody. Because that's part of our culture, too, is I want to make sure I'm not obligated to anybody, that I don't owe anybody anything so I can be free. And so what, what does this story say to us, brothers and sisters? What is it telling us? You know that the consequences of our non-obligation culture is extreme loneliness and continual broken relationships. Continual broken relationships. And if all of us are honest about ourselves, we probably have in our past a long line of broken relationships. And I think the Lord has a better way. The Lord wants us to have obligations. Is the story of Ruth speaking to us about our resistance to obligations and relationships? Because, of course, they do go hand in hand. Let me ask you this. What kind of obligations do we have as a church? Are we obligated to one another? Listen to what Romans 13, 8 says. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. We owe each other love. That is an obligation. That's a rule. That's something that we are obligated and expected to do by God, whether or not we like it. 
Another one, Romans 15, 1. We are strong, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. We're supposed to be looking out for other people and it says we are obligated by the Lord Jesus Christ to do it. We need to commit to it as a way to be. But there's a greater point to this, brothers and sisters, than, our, than ourselves, and that is this. The greatest obligation that we are to commit to is our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Ruth is all like Abraham, but I want you to think about this for just a moment. Ruth... Um, had more to deal with in opposition to her faith than Abraham did. God called Abraham to leave his homeland and go to a promised land because God told him to and made him a promise. Ruth is willing to leave her homeland and go to the promised land with no promise. No promise. And not only that, but Ruth went to the promised land and taking God as her God in uh, with opposition from her own mother-in-law. The one Jewish lady she knew is saying, don't come, and she went anyways. Ruth was loyal. Ruth was kind. This shows that the obligation to God and the people of God comes at great cost. We can't afford to be under obligation to God, or excuse me, we can ex can't expect to be under obligation to God and for life to be easy and comfortable. Obligating to the Lord means that we have to give some things up and be willing like Ruth did to leave things behind and to stick to our obligation. As Jesus said to Peter in Luke 18, 28 through 30, Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. After Jesus had said that it's very hard for the wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. When we obligate ourselves to Lord Jesus Christ, the loyalty uh, and the faith means that we are willing to sacrifice for the obligation, willing to give some things up, some personal things. And so that's what Ruth did. She showed us faith to God, and she showed us how to treat one another. And she goes... And Naomi Yo says, well, fine then. <laughs> and she's blessed for it. But the third choice is this, bitter obligation. Let's read verses 19 through 22. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Unlike Ruth, Naomi was an old follower of God. She was someone who was obligated to the Lord. She calls him the Almighty. She believes in his sovereignty. She believes in his, in his greatness and his power. But it shows us that her obligation to God had not turned out like she had wanted it to. The crowd that formed didn't even hardly recognize her, possibly because her appearance had changed because she had been so beaten down by the difficulties of life. And she says, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. So what she's saying is she left pleasant and came back bitter. She wanted to identify herself as someone who was different, still in obligation to God, but frustrated about it and quite bitter about it. She blamed her bitterness on God. She said, it's God who did these things to me that created my bitterness. She had faith in God's um, sovereignty, but you know what she didn't have faith in was God's goodness. She only saw the bad that he allowed in her life. And in verse 21, she claimed that the death of her family was God's testimony, his statement against her. And then she, spe she, then she specifies that her calamities were against her alone. And I think in this, we can see that there's a couple of points about our obligations creating bitterness. And the first is this. When we are bitter in our obligations, we are showing ourselves to be primarily self-centered. We're primar primarily thinking about ourselves as if we are the most important thing. 
After all, it was her husband and sons who had died. She actually was given life. Yet she's angry at God that she, he allowed her to live, which, if you look at it from a different perspective, was extremely merciful. But she couldn't see that because she was so self-centered. So bitterness leads to an obsessive focus on you instead of looking at God's bitter, bigger plan for you or the people around you. So can we see the things in our lives as we are obligated to God and we're in this covenant relationship where we have obligations and life hasn't turned out like we like, can we turn from a self-centered perspective to a God-centered perspective and say, God, I believe in your goodness for me in the midst of your sovereignty and that will change my heart. But the second thing we see here is that bitterness separates people from God. Bitterness separates people from God. Can you trust God and be bitter at the same time? Can you? Can you say, I trust God, but I'm bitter about what he's done in my life? And you know what's interesting is when we're bitter at other people, the truth is we're actually bitter at God. If you're bitter at someone else, you're actually also bitter at God because you're bitter that he allowed that person to do that to you. Because if you believe in his sovereignty, you believe he's in, got, got your good intention in mind, and he's working that thing in your life for good. So if you're bitter about something that's happening in your life, you don't really believe that he's working out for good, do you? So bitterness separates people from God in relationship. We may be in covenant, we may be obligated, but we're living in a bad relationship with the Lord from our side. Brothers and sisters, bitterness is a sin. And like any sin, God wants it out of our lives. Very often, the reason for our bitterness is broken relationships. If you listen to people talk, or yourself, or myself, if you think, if, you, if, you, if people in your realm talk about their life and how it's turned out, it will almost always be based on what bad thing happened to you because of what somebody did. And so God actually wants that removed out of your life. What we have to do is give our, obli our broken obligations and our broken relationships to the Lord entirely into his will. And we can either seek to repair them or accept them as they are. But either way, we're saying, Lord, your will be done. Lord, I trust you in this. As Hebrews 12, 14 through 15 says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness within one which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Bitterness will keep us from the grace of God. And so we should strive to be at peace with everyone and to live a, according to the holiness of Christ. And so we see here that, that uh, Naomi is remained and choosing, by the way, that's a choice to be bitter in her obligation. And then verse 22 tells us that they are staying now in Bethlehem at the beginning of the harvest, which sets us up for next week. So I close with this, brothers and sisters. We all have choices in our obligations, whether it be your marriage, your friendships, your children, your parents, your church family, or the Lord God Almighty himself. We all have choices about how we are going to respond to the nature of those relationships we can be bitter, or we can be loyal and kind. And the ultimate obligation we have to be loyal and kind and honoring is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. And we pray that we would choose to be like Ruth and to hold on to our relationships and to hold on to our obligations, Lord, and, and to seek them out in, in the way that she did, Lord. Wanting to uh, receive the blessing, but also give a blessing of relationship. And so, Lord, help us to think through these things and to look back on this chapter this week and that you would conform us to that image. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you stand with us as we answer with, bless the Lord, O my soul.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger, Your name is great and Your heart is for all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. We will worship Your holy name. Lord, I'll worship Your holy name. Sing like never before. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. We will worship Your holy name. I will worship Your holy name. Amen, church. Let's finish with praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise
Amen. Go with the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are dismissed. Stick around for Sunday school.